Can you share with us the story of fu how Fungi Perfecti began and what led you to start your micro-entrepreneurial journey? That's a great question, and I have a really good answer um, that I think is a model uh, for a lot of entrepreneurs to follow. It's not the formula for success, um, but in my case, um, it, it can be. So it could be a formula for success for other people. Uh, but I have a lot of caveats to add once I describe this. Um, so I was um, became a teacher's assistant um, in my senior year at the Evergreen State College, helping Dr. Michael Bug um, teach a class. And since I had cultivation skills, we had a DEA license and I was using a scanning electron microscope. And um, because Michael had a DEA license, then I need to have fresh material through the winter time and spring when psilocybin mushrooms are not growing naturally, we were able to make the argument that we had to cultivate them. <laughs> so I cultivated a lot of psilocybin mushroom species in the laboratories under a DEA approved license. Um, I was hyper paranoid because I we had spontaneous inspections and I was a long haired hippie. So I fit the stereotype of somebody who, you know, would be suspicious and uh, in the eyes of the government. Uh, but I long ago adopted the mantra, uh, nature supplies, I don't. And, and the big thing about psilocybin mushrooms, one of the reasons why I don't supply them is there's karma involved. I inherit somebody else's trip and their experience. If someone has a bad trip and I gave them the mushrooms, well, I'm part of that bad trip, right? Wow. So I feel a really strong responsibility for the psychological well-being of anybody taking a sacrament that I would produce. Uh, and I'm not a skilled therapist, you know. I, so um, my own personal use of them is, is a private spiritual matter. Um, but I long ago realized that these were such powerful medicines that I didn't do that. So I cultivated a lot of psilocybin mushrooms in a laboratory at the Evergreen State College and used the specimens for the scanning electron microscope. Well, they started growing gourmet mushrooms, oyster and shiitake, my mother was much happier because <laughs> she, she could eat those. She, she wouldn't touch the, touch the magic mushrooms. But so Michael asked me to be his assistant. And then after upon graduation, he asked me to, uh, to be an adjunct faculty member at the Evergreen State College teaching several classes that were ongoing because the classes were very popular. But I had a skill set that Michael didn't have. Um, and I specialized in the taxonomy of psilocybin mushrooms. So my focus was that he's an organic chemist. Mm. He actually wrote the protocol that accurately identified psilocybin. He was called in an expert witness um, in many court cases to basically throw out the government's case because they had flawed analyt analytical techniques. So he wrote a paper to accurately identify psilocybin and psilocin in mushrooms, published that paper, and then said, well, since I'm correcting the DEA on their techniques, you know, they'd likely be favorable to me get a license, and indeed they were. So, um, so of course, I didn't teach about growing psilocybin mushrooms in my class. I taught about gourmet mushrooms, oyster and shiitake and portobellos and maitake, et cetera. But as most everybody knows, the, the um, techniques uh, are really parallel. <laughs> so you just substitute the species and you kind of get the information anyhow. So I, I was teaching this class and I had to come up with a syllabus. Mike asked me to, hey, you know, we need a syllabus for a class. So I very quickly, the night or two nights before, wrote up a syllabus for the class. And it just came out of nowhere. I'm in front of the class of about 30 people. And I said, here's a syllabus. And it actually looks like a table of contents for a book. And in fact, I'm gonna use this to write a new book. And if you, buy a pre-publication order of the book for six bucks. I promise you, I'll send you a copy of the book. So that was interesting. And then because labs, the laboratory, uh, there's a kind of, I call the czar of lab stores. He, I give him a great, great credit because every time I wanted to order some Petri dishes, I, I'd be interrogated to the nth degree. And I just think he just like wielding his power to control me because I was in a hurry. I had to get things done. I wanted to order this lab equipment. And he would ask me, why do you need it? How are you going to use it? I'm going, this is ridiculous. So I decided, okay, 
if I got you know 10 or 20 cases of Petri dishes, I could probably get them wholesale as a reseller. So I did. And so in the next class, you know, people are asking, or towards the end of the class, where you can get these resources. So I created a one-page, you know, laboratory supply sheet that would have laboratory equipment specific, specific to the class. Okay, so then I, I so I taught the class, and I had this lab sheet, and I said, oh, I might as well put down copies, pre, pre-orders of the book on this little, you know, one-page flyer advertise my new mail order business, which I just created on the spot. And so I ended up creating three points. So pre-publication copies of a book I had not written based on table of contents, a one page flyer with equipment specific to mushroom cultivation. And the book, when it came out, then advertised the other two, the mail order businesses and the classes. So I created a triangle of literally robbing Peter to pay Paul. Because I was borrowing, I got about five thousand dollars in pre-orders from my students, um, and that allowed me to print the catalog. That allowed me to send the catalog out to, to have more people order pre-publication copies of the book, and they'd order the equipment, and it would also advertise the classes. And so I started spinning this little, you know, sort of permaculture profit wheel. Yes. You know, faster and faster. And, um, and, and it, it works sort of, and what I want to say about that is I, um, I faced a lot of challenges in my life and, um, the attitude that I had, especially when I was younger is every challenge will make me stronger. Mm. And so it's like exercise. It's it. I only am here today through the kindness and generosity of other people. Mm. There's, I paid, I paid every bill for 10 years, every utility bill, you know, every phone bill on the date of disconnection, not a week before on the date of disconnection, I was chasing checks. I didn't have time to balance my checkbook. I packed 30,000 boxes by myself. Hmm. So you can, you know, you know, so I would call up the public utility, uh, a district, you know, three six zero four two six eight two eight three, and uh, and eight oh one on the date of disconnection, and uh, and there was a pool of of employees after about two years on the date of disconnection around the phone saying Paul Stamos is going to call, and they'd bet whether he's going to call or not. And at eight oh one, the phone would ring, and after a while, I would hear this cheering going on in the background. I had no idea what it was going on. <laughs> And they really quickly learned, don't bet against Paul Stamets, you know. He's, yeah. He's <laughs> but I had to stretch my cash flow. My, my lawyer told me, if you give official notification, it's illegal for them to cut off your bill. Mm. So I thought, okay, I could, I could use that information. Uh, so, I mean, but then, you know, I just put myself out there. And um, I, you know, I, I have... Um, I just refused to, to quit mm. St- stamina and um, my parents, my mother, not my mother, but my father said, you'd never be successful in life growing mushrooms. You should work for IBM or general electric, you know? And so one of my, you know, parents, even though they're well intended, they can give some of the worst advice, you know, and the best advice is not to follow their advice, you know, follow your passion and your interest because it was never to me about money. It was about science. It was about knowledge, exploring this underground universe of mycelium and mushrooms. And because they were forbidden fruit, you know, I was even more attracted to them because they so many. And when I go to the libraries, the University of Washington, all the journals that anything on psilocybin mushrooms had been razored out. Mm. And so that made me more interested. All of, the library books were just ripped apart with anything on psilocybin mushrooms. So you couldn't get the information. So I thought, wow, if there's that much interest in this, and I have that interest, well, there's a shared community there that are, are hungry for knowledge. So I think finding something that's eclectic where people are hungry for knowledge, where the knowledge is being controlled or restricted by gatekeepers, mm. whether 
my access to petri dishes from the lab stores or the library books from very conservative mycologists, many of whom were opposed to me for decades. Mm. When I first went to the North American Mycological Association conference, I met Gary Linkoff. It's like I had a force field of repulsion. I'd walk into a crowd and there'd be, people would just be pushed away. They didn't want to be seen with me because I was a long haired hippie and he must be into magic mushrooms. And that was our foreboding subject. And so that's really interesting to me that, that it was so disturbing and unsettling to the status quo. And that me, and I knew that psilocybin mushrooms were so helpful to me. And they were so good on so many levels that I felt it was important for me to stand up for psilocybin mushrooms stand up for the earth, stand up for nature, um, and, um, you know, push up, push against these people, yeah. you know, because the yeah. more they pushed me down, the more I wanted to push forward. I realized that their suppression is only an indication of how valuable this knowledge is. So now we have a worldwide revolution in the, from the, from the mycelial underground that's sweeping the planet. And I think we just only have begun to tap into the resources and the opportunities. These are, these are, I mean, just explained many times, you know, these are network-based organisms. They're externalized brains. They're externalized stomachs, they're externalized lungs. You know, these, these you know, we are descendants of mycelium and uh, the mycelium chose the underground route, but these are network-based organisms that have within them by their own design and innate ability to adapt and to store information and have a form of intelligence that gives us the opportunities to use them to, to have new discoveries, either discoveries they've already have and we're rediscovering them, or we challenge them with a xenobiotic you know, toxin, something that a human created, to see if they can elocute a response and in doing so, once they produce an enzyme or a new antibiotic, that becomes encoded inside the, the, the DNA of, of the fungus. And so you, in a sense, can vaccinate these strains and educate them uh, to xenobiotic threats that heretofore have not been encountered, but because of their network-based design, they're very adept at coming up with clever solutions.